right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I have the pleasure of giving a brief overview of one of our current active studies. Um, this is a trial um, that we've kind of been referring to as heart in a box, and it refers to a new way of preserving hearts for transplant. So historically, what's done is when a brain dead donor is identified, uh, the procurement team um, will cross-plant the heart, cardioplegia, flush it, put it in a uh, basically ice bath, uh, put it in a cooler, and that's how it's transported. From the time that the urine is cross-clamped until it's released in the recipient, we're limited to about four hours. It can be a little bit longer, but outcomes start to get worse at that point. So it really limits our geographic area. Um, this is a new technology where the heart is uh, preserved with about a liter of donor blood and is in a machine that keeps it beating. So it's a warm perfusion method. Um, this can extend the time outside of the body, so to speak, out to, up to about eight hours. Um, we are very excited to be a part of this trial. We've now had three patients that have been treated with this device. <clears throat> um, about, I think it's seven centers nationally that are participating in the current study, uh, places like Columbia, Duke, Massachusetts General, so we're a part of a, a very well-established group of hospitals. What's particularly exciting about this is that this also gives us access to uh, participate potentially. Um, in the trial of donation after cardiac death, which has uh, been present in other organs for quite some time, but I think you can understand why we're not as eager to use uh, cardiac death hearts for transplant. But the difference here is this heart can be put on this machine and essentially evaluated and to some degree resuscitated. Um, so it's expanding our uh, access to organs and uh, it's really a fantastic trial that we couldn't do without support from uh, the hospital and our partners. And, um, he's not here, but want to tip my hat to Tom Talley, who uh, really stuck his neck out to help get the financing for the first phase of this because it was not free. So thank you. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Grill. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's about 9, 10 o'clock last night. And I go up to my wife and say, take a picture of me. <laughs> and she looks at, you know, gets that look that the spouse gives you like, Okay, Dork, what are you up to now? <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 you got to take this picture because I got this email from Chris Portman that I have to do this. Oh. And so I, she takes the picture and says, you look like an angry old man. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like this hand thing you're supposed to do, you know, and I look like a dinosaur or something. <laughs> and so I do that. And then I go to the, this email and I'm looking like step two, I'm supposed to send my picture to somebody, but now it's like, the day and it's like 10 o'clock at night so then I'm like well then there's this other way that you can create your own poster so I go I create my own poster that's step two but then step three is where it's just really impossible for my generation I guess I have to post it now my wife calls me I'm a Facebook creeper which means that I look at all your stuff but I never post anything and I gotta figure out how to post it so this is where now like I'm getting really anxious because I'm always thinking like if you post something that it goes to like the 1.6 billion people that are on Facebook you know or something like that so I finally say okay I can just do this and I can write my little message and I can like post it to all my friends hopefully that's the only place it goes and then it says now you have to tag MHIF. That, the only thing I know about tagging is a game I played when I was little, and all I could figure out was I'm still here. <laughs> but I never quite got so Chris, I didn't tag you, but I got as far as a picture, and I know that it worked because I got light. <laughs> huh? So how about that? That was my accomplishment of Sunday night. But this is even more exciting. So I've been looking forward to having Kate here for like six months because I think of her every time I'm on hospital service, as all of us do. It's an epidemic um, that has infected cardiovascular care and of course our entire society. And so it's uh, really exciting that we have on our campus such an expert as we have in Kate. So Kate uh, Katzen, we all know her, 34233, um, as one of our attendees of the emergency department and chair of the department, but that's not all. A real renaissance woman that also is a consultant with the Minnesota Poison Control uh, System and assistant medical director of Mission Detox Center in Plymouth. She was telling me about this grant that she had gotten recently also that's really cool about creating an, an addiction system center kind of bridge clinic 
um, that also I think is critically important to our patients while we're always looking for social resources and that to support their success once they leave our care. Um, Kate graduated the University of Minnesota. She completed her emergency medicine uh, training at Regis Hospital in St. Paul, uh, as well as an additional fellowship in addiction medicine. Uh, if that's not enough, she's board certified in emergency medicine, medical toxicology, and addiction medicine. And of course, has special interest in early uh, evaluation and treatment of patients in opioid crisis, and then their uh, ongoing care and transition out of the hospital. So without further ado, and with one last, <laughs> Kate Katzen. <laughs> Well, thank you guys for having me. So I do have a little bit of a different background than what you've probably been used to here. So please ask any questions. So what I was asked to when Dave approached me was to talk about management options for opioid use in these complex cardiovascular patients that we deal with in the hospital. So to put it in background, I've been with Abbott now for five years and we are working on getting our addiction consult service up. It is up as of September 3rd, but prior to that, I was involved in the ethics committee kind of de facto by Warren Kearney on some of these more complex patients that are followed by the advanced heart failure service. Um, so that's kind of what brought the interest here in talking about this. So objectives today, I'm going to give you a brief little historical review here of the opioid epidemic, our current state, and the neurobiology of addiction. I'm going to use a case review of infectious endocarditis and going through that, um, talking about some of these common scenarios we deal with. Again, I'm not a cardiologist, so I'm not going into the cardiovascular care of the patient. I'm coming at it from my perspective as an addiction medicine provider. And then we're going to be discussing treatment options for opioid use disorder. <coughs> I have no relevant financial arrangements to disclose. So the scope of the problem. So this is a slide um, from the CDC here. And what you're seeing, and I've told I can't use the pointer on here, is there's been, there's three waves to the opioid crisis. The first wave that we see is the rise in prescription pill over, overdose deaths. That's with the pill mills that we saw um, and then the crackdown on pill mills. We then led into the rise in heroin overdose deaths. It became cheaper to get heroin than it was to get your MS cotton. A tablet of MS cotton went for about one milligram, cost about a buck per milligram. So if you had 120 tablet, it's cheaper to buy heroin on the street. So that's what kind of led to that rise. And then the third rise that we're now seeing is in the synthetic opioid epidemic. I'm sure you guys have all been hearing about the fentanyl analogs. I can tell you that we are seeing it in the emergency department. Patients on the street, I always talk to my patients about what they're using, I have no shame. Um, they will say that they are seeking fentanyl. The dose makes the poison. Um, which is a quote from Paracelsus. So if you're a toxicologist, that's kind of our motto. And these patients are now learning to titrate fentanyl. So um, this is, um, just shows annual, it's a brief history kind of of the opioid epidemic and it's talking about rise in prescribing rates over time on high dose. And then um, this is the average daily MMEs. So you can see, I've got this, so I wanna walk. But you can see now there has been a decline in the MMEs per day. You've seen the CDC guidelines going out there. We have distinct recommendations. We don't want people over 90 MMEs per day. There are studies that have shown basically overdose risk with greater than 50, 40 to 50 MMEs per day, um, as well as addiction. And so you're just seeing that there's the trend and then there's now going to be a decrease in supply and demand, essentially. This is from Minnesota, the state of Minnesota. This is looking at their timeline of death. This is uh, from their opioid dashboard. The most updated demographic is as of 2017. All opioid deaths as of 2017 was 422. They don't have the 2018 data listed yet. You can see that there is this rise in the orange line here of these synthetic opioids now. So we're seeing increasing in death rates. Um, if you go to a medical examiner case, they've had to develop special assay panels that they send out on postmortem blood to look for some of these fentanyl analogs. So this could potentially be underrepresented based on the time frame that we're seeing because the um, science has to catch up with being able to measure these analytes in blood. And then heroin is on a slight decline, amazingly, which is, doesn't feel like that based on what I'm seeing in the ER, but the statistics. A little light reading for anyone. I recommend these books at every lecture I give. This Dreamland by Sam Quinones. Have any of you guys read it? Can I see a show of hands? Yes. 
I loved this book because I thought it was an excellent study. Number one, it's a great business model if you're a Mexican heroin dealer. Um, but it's a great intersection of the opioid epidemic, pill mills, how that went on the decline, and then you get this rise in the Mexican heroin cartels. So it gives a very good study in the um, kind of what happened. And it's easy reading. It's not a, it's not a boring textbook like you. So the neurobiology of addiction. Uh, this comes up often. Addiction is a brain disease. Um, addiction medicine providers believe this. You get neuroadaptations. It's not a moral failing. It's not because you can't do it. I came at this. Everybody talks about motivation as to what you get into things. I have a sister who is a heroin addict. She's in recovery now for a year. She went in and out multiple times before she became stable. She's now stable on Suboxone, um, getting her check-ins every two weeks. So that's where I come at from seeing this. Because uh, personally, in the state of Washington, mind you, not here, I saw the limitations in the systems in those states. And this is kind of what drives my motivation for what we're doing. But you need to view these patients as a person. They're somebody's sister. Um, it's not that they have lack of willpower. Nobody wants to be an addict. That's a quote from Nora Volkow, who's that NIDA director. So you need to understand briefly, and this might be a little more basic for people, um, the understanding between dependence versus addiction. We often get consulted on patients who are more dependent, but they're not exhibiting the aberrant behaviors. So dependence, any one of us can become dependent on opioids. You know, you get a patient who has a spine surgery, they're on their PCA or whatever, they're gonna be dependent by the time they leave this hospital. And that's because you're developing these structural changes in the brain. And so then without opioids, you then lead to um, a withdrawal state. So dependence is characterized with a withdrawal syndrome. You can be physically dependent, but you do not have to be addicted. However, addiction, you will be dependent as part of that. So addiction, this is from the American Society of Addiction Medicine. It's one of our governing bodies uh, for addiction medicine providers is that it's a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and circuitry. So they talk about the four C's. So compulsive drug seeking, harmful consequences. You get these cycles of relapse and remission. Um, and then we go to the brain model. So uh, Nora Volkow, like I said, she's the head of the... National Institutes on Drug Abuse, um, talks about the brain disease model of addiction. This is an excellent review from the New England Journal in 2016 that basically talks about this. And it's like a three-phase cycle is how I like to think of it. So you get your initial binge and intoxication state. And this is our reward center of the brain. So this is where your dopamine is. Dopamine makes people feel good. I eat an entire cheesecake. I feel good. I have dopamine going coursing through my system. However, in eating my cheesecake, I then have a natural satiety kind of turns things off. We found that with binging on drugs, you don't get that satiety set point turn off. It's like studies that were done, we learned about in med school where the mice, they have the choice of eating or doing cocaine and they just keep doing cocaine, like pushing the cocaine button. That's where that comes from. So then you stop your binging and then you get your negative effects. So this is that withdrawal state. This is your amygdala, your fight or flight, your stress. So I now go into withdrawal and I feel like crap. So you start to kind of get this perseveration on it. This is your frontal lobe. So you get your perseveration. So you're in withdrawal. You don't want to feel like you're in withdrawal. So you start, start thinking about what can I do to get out of this state. And then you lead back. And it just becomes this vicious cycle where you can start out on a milder spectrum. So you can have patients like these chronic pain patients from the, like the pill mill era where they were behaving themselves. They became tolerant. Maybe they weren't getting enough. They were taking an extra pill here or there. That's more of a misuse phenomenon, but misuse can easily lead to abuse. And then you start exhibiting these aberrant behaviors, which then become addiction. So the reward pathway, um, this is the dopamine pathway is what we think of. So you get your opioid, it's positive reinforcement. It's gonna bind your opioid receptors. You get the squirt of dopamine, it makes you feel good. And then you're just trying to, trying to keep um, going down that pathway. And that leads to these compulsive behaviors. And so then this is another kind of example. So you get opioid dependence. People can be abstinent for many years. This is where we get at it being a relapsing and remitting problem that you have. You're always in recovery. You will always be an addict. You're just in recovery for any amount of time. And it's because you can get a stressor event. 
experience can lead to memory recall or you get a sensory cue and this goes into the more psychology psychiatry aspect of things where um, you know my sister for example if she goes out with this is why we say don't like you need to get away from your friends that you're using you go back in a situation where your friends are all using and then you get these sensory drug cues it's like a Pavlovian response almost and it makes it much harder to stay abstinent so then you can get relapse so this is the DSM-5 criteria. This is pretty standard. This is what I use when I'm seeing a patient on the floor. So we like to think of it as the C's. So loss of control. You get these physiologic changes. You get con you know, consequences and continued use. So the way I look at it, this is again from um, a New England Journal article is where this is stolen from. But people can be, have a spectrum. And I want people to realize that this, it's not that you're all just a severe addict. I feel the ones that we see that are inpatient with endocarditis, for example, I guarantee you if you're coming in and you're being admitted with infectious endocarditis, you're severe. <laughs> but there are many people that are highly functioning addicts in the community. So, um, you know, if you're, and just to be aware that dependence and withdrawal, everybody has those as part of the DSM criteria, but these cannot be the sole criteria. So I couldn't say that you're mild if you only have these. You have to have two to three of the others on along with it because physiologically you are going to be dependent on withdrawal. So if you see a, uh, if I see a patient and I'll be like opioid use disorder, severe, active, or they can be in remission or on agonist therapy, there's different kind of um, titles for it, but we would characterize it as mild, moderate, or severe. And just again, that realizing it's a spectrum of illness. So this is a case that I have been kind of peripherally involved in. And then once our service was up and running and we could actually go and kind of do things, um, have now been seeing and following this patient. Some of you may be familiar with her um, because I guarantee that the cardiology service has been involved in her care. So this is a 21-year-old female who is in hospital right now. History of heroin IV drug use. She's admitted for severe sepsis. This is her um, sentinel admission in our system respiratory failure and presumed infectious endocarditis. So CV surgery saw her within her first 24, 48 hours and recommended no surgical intervention, six weeks of antibiotics and a repeat echo when you know, she's done her antibiotics kind of standard follow-up, I'm assuming. So she grew MSSA, Staph aureus. This was, I didn't know how to put fancy videos in my, doc, in my uh, PowerPoint, so I apologize. So I just have the read. Um, so this was her TEE at the time. I'm not going to belabor this too much. Obviously, she's got endocarditis, <laughs> um, um, tricuspid valve endocarditis, uh, which I feel is more standard that we see in these IV drug users. We can see. Um, kind of background on this patient: uh, she has poor socioeconomic status, severely limited family members that are active drug users. Um, she's had a child that's been taken away, is my understanding, and in care of family members. She's been prostituted. She's had everything that could go wrong in a person's life go wrong. So she's not set up to succeed, which we can all probably agree on that, anyone who's helped take care of her. Oh, on top of that, she's got septic emboli. Oh, and she's got hepatitis C, which was diagnosed. This initial course, she had a failed extubation, so she ends up with a trach. She developed stress cardiomyopathy. These are just some of the um, ejection fraction estimates from prior to discharge. And so she was discharged to Bethesda for rehab on IV cefazolin. What's missing in this discharge plan? Nobody really addressed the addiction, which me coming at it as the addiction provider, the cardiology care, superb, excellent, first in the nation. I, I would want to come here for this. But we're missing the root of the problem, and without dealing with the root of the problem, guess what? She's back, and she's going to keep coming back. Um, so that was my concern. That was just the one thing. And we don't, didn't have those resources here, so it's not like you could. So no fault, but this is one of the limitations that we're seeing with management of patients all around the nation, not just here. So um, this was just this ACP Weekly. One of my colleagues literally just emailed it to me this week. And it's based on this article that was from the Journal of the American Heart Association, so just recently published. And this was a retrospective cohort study of patients that were admitted with infectious endocarditis 
Um, and they called it, they used the NIS and it was from 2002 to 2016. And my understanding of this NIS is it's this huge database and software tools developed from the healthcare cost and utilization project. And so it contains data for more than 7 million uh, hospital stays each year. And what they found was this. So there is a rise in the incidence and prevalence rates of endocarditis. Bumping things. So the incidence is increasing. So now we're at 29 per 10,000 per year. And um, in those with drug-associated endocarditis, it's increased from 48 per 10,000 to 79. So guess what? This is going to be on our doorstep. It's not getting better. It's only going to get worse, which means we need to come up with plans on how to treat these patients. And so basically, they've also found there's been a near doubling in the prevalence from 2002. It was around 8%. Um, with an annual percentage change of 3.5%. And then this is where it kind of hits home. This is the annual percentage change, and they regionalized it. We are the top here in the Midwest. So the percentage change was found to be the highest in the Midwest. And so 4.9%, so we we're kind of higher than others. Um, basically, what they've also did is they stratified these patients. So patients with infectious endocarditis, and we probably can all intuitively guess this, they're younger. They're more commonly white males. They're usually poor, poor socioeconomic status. Um, they had four fewer comorbidities. Obviously, they're younger. You would expect fewer comorbidities. Higher rates of hepatitis C also makes sense with IV drug use. Um, and more likely to have HIV. Also, more likely to have on concomitant alcohol abuse or mental health disorders or liver disease. Also, these patients with the infectious endocarditis related to uh, drug abuse had longer length of stays, uh, nine versus seven days, and, and, when, and they were more likely to undergo cardiac surgery. So 7.8% in the non-drug using category, um, or 7.8% in the drug using category, 6.2 in the non. And their in-white patient mortality, though, was lower. Also makes sense in that they are more healthy coming into it theoretically. Um, I pulled this, uh, was a, I just liked the idea of this. So this was from the American Association for Thoracic Surgery Consensus Guidelines. And um, this article, the previous article, kind of talked about this and referenced it. So they recommend specialized endocarditis teams that should manage the patients. Um, in the actual consensus statement, it didn't mention addiction medicine. But in this previous article, it talks about having an addiction medicine provider as part of these specialized teams to help weigh in on these patients. And just in those, I mean, this was a very broad statement, but talking about that there is an inherent risk of relapse and recurrent, i.e. in these patients, which again, intuitive, makes sense. If you're not treating the primary problem, this can happen. So back to our patient. She left Bethesda AMA after two weeks, so didn't even finish her antibiotics, I believe, and she was lost to follow up. She had ongoing drug use, which we would expect. So then she was readmitted here at Abbott, uh, 27 to 314, now had MRSA bacteremia, not MSSA, septic emboli, respiratory failure, the whole nine yards again. This is just her uh, TEE, I believe. This one was her TEE. So vegetation is worse, regurgitation is worse. And at this time, ethics, I think this is when I maybe first heard about this patient not in our service was not live. So ethics was consulted, psychiatry was involved. I mean, every, it was an all hands on deck. I believe there was care conferences for this patient. Pain team was involved. The pain team was managing her with Dilaudid and she was requiring exorbitant amounts of it for ad adequate pain control. She also was not a very easy patient to deal with and I'm sure many of you who had worked with her could probably attest to that um, due to some psychiatric issues maybe personality issues, um, would refuse cares. So then she, the decision was made. She underwent a tricuspid valve replacement on 220. This is just her stay. So 222, she was traked again. Um, 225, they were, she had a renal failure of some sort. She was on CRRT, I believe, at one point. Had a tunneled catheter placement. Then apparently had a respiratory PEA arrest during this and had a massive hemoptysis and was found subsequently to have a large ruptured mycotic pulmonary artery aneurysm, which was successfully coiled. On top of that, she then let, had a TBR thrombus, and so was anticoagulated for that. So then this time, she was discharged to a long-term care facility, so this was Region C, 
I think she was declined previously at Bethesda when I was digging through the notes. She completed her antibiotics, yay, um, and a Rule 25 assessment. So was discharged from the program. Does everyone know what a Rule 25 assessment is? Okay, so a Rule 25 assessment in the state of Minnesota, it's a personal pet peeve, it is going away, but to qualify for treatment, if you're on like a Medicaid public assistance, you have to go through this Rule 25 assessment, assistance, assessment, and it's a big pain in the butt. It's like this one to two hour interview where they go through and ask a bunch of questions, kind of stratify, stratify you, and it's basically so the state determines who, of all these assessments comes through, who gets money to pay for treatment. It is a big limiter in our patients to be able to successfully get into treatment programs. Number one, this patient doesn't have a high healthcare literacy. Do you expect her to discharge? Like the first time, it was more like you expect her to discharge and show up and get her own Rule 25 assessment. I hate to say it, but there's a lot of hand-holding that needs to kind of go on with this, and there's multiple factors that contribute to it. At least at uh, Regency, they had someone come in and do this assessment. And I think these assessments, again, not the expert on them, but aren't, are good for maybe like 30, there's a time frame on them. So if you don't like do what you're supposed to, and the, I think it's like 30 to 60 days and the time lapses, then you got to do it again. It's kind of asinine. So at the time of discharge, it was a four to six week, for, week wait for inpatient treatment somewhere. And that was like, if she wanted to bring her child with her, it was going to be six weeks. But at minimum, if she went by herself, it was four weeks. And this is my big pet peeve, because what are we expecting here? So this is from her discharge summary. So she was on oxycodone, I think like five milligrams on a, I don't remember if it was a scheduled basis or PRN, but she was actively taking a narcotic up until the day of discharge, and nobody prescribed it at discharge. The family asked, and this is what they were told. Because of your history, you need a primary care doctor to follow up and prescribe your narcotics. When I dug through the chart as much as I could, she did not necessarily have an established primary care provider. At one of our discharges from Abbott, there was a plan for her to set up and go to a primary care appointment to establish care. She didn't make it. So this is just a setup for failure because of course, what's gonna happen? Yeah, yeah, I mean like I can't get my oxy, heroin's cheap. So then she, I mean, I guess, so what was she discharged in like April, potentially from the LTAC? And she made it till July, and then she st she's kind of lost to follow up, which is kind of the trajectory of these patients. She made it till July, um, and then she was seen in the Fairview University system. She went in through their ED, was admitted for sepsis with presumed recurrent endocarditis. Blood cultures at that time, I think, were growing MSSA. I think. She had ongoing heroin and also methamphetamine IV drug use. Noted to have a recurrent vegetation on her tricuspid valve. So the CV surgery consult and I, was that no surgical intervention recommended given reoperative nature in the use of her one-shot surgical approach. Um, and then the high rate of recidivism and active drug use. So she left AMA within a day. So I wanted to talk about this one-shot surgical approach because this is something that there's some controversy. Again, not, I'm not the cardiothoracic surgeon, so you guys are more familiar with this. Um, this was from the New York Times. This was something that got sent to me. I think this came out, it looks like for probably April 2018. And this was a, I believe it's a cardiothoracic surgeon out of Tennessee is kind of talking about this one shot approach and how potentially the reasoning behind you need to support these patients and that a second shot might be indicated. Um, it was very kind of public and in the news. It's actually a really great article just to read. But then I kind of did a little PubMed and there's not a ton on it that I found that was like published studies, but this was a commentary on ethics and cardiothoracic surgery, like when is enough and enough. And then this one was interesting. This is from a, I think it is Norwegian study. Um, and what they did is they kind of did an ethical analysis, again, not the, the ethicist, but they went through an ethical analysis of these patients. And it, they talked about one of the things being like the average lifespan of a patient after the valve replacement being one to two years and why should that impede them with quality of life. And so this was what they're based on the principle of equal treatment and expected survival that they, their premise was that they should receive the same treatment as other patients in whom a corresponding treatment um, effect is expected. So they're saying, don't just have this no, one shot, you're done. 
perspective of doing things. At least consider these patients. Not saying that everyone deserves a second shot, but taking them to a case rounds with your cardiothoracic surgeon, with your addiction medicine provider, with your psychiatrist, and coming up with kind of a consensus among the group. Um, what we have found is that there is a suboptimal addiction intervention for patients that are hospitalized with endocarditis. Um, this was a study out of the American Journal of Medic Medicine from 2016. And what this did was a retrospective review of patients who were hospitalized with injection drug use. And so Boston in the addiction world, Boston, Massachusetts is kind of the big, Boston and Yale, Gail D'Onofrio does a lot of the ED-based interventions out of Yale. So she's kind of one of the people there that are, are pretty amazing. But Boston is kind of a center of excellence for this coordinated care for these patients. So a lot of these studies have come out of Boston. And what they found is that um, out of the 102 patients that were admitted with infectious endocarditis related to drug use, 49% um, were readmitted, and 27.5% roughly had an ongoing recurrent infection um, related infective endocarditis at the readmission. And this was interesting because this, this other part, it's not up here. So the median time to readmission for these patients was around 35 days. But then the median time to readmission for a recurrent infective endocarditis was around 216 days. This patient that we're talking about kind of is in that, they get lost to follow up for a while, they fall off, they get sicker, they come in. So it, it kind of fits. Um, this just talks about interventions that they had. And I'm a big fan of take-home naloxone. I feel all of these patients should be given a Narcan kit. Narcan kit. None got one in all of these interventions. There was kind of a mix, like very good with social work. They had an addiction clinical nurse that was available, so maybe 23%. On readmission, a little lower there, but if it was their infectious drug use, a little more. Um, psychiatry, just the kind of paucity. And then the plans at discharge for medic Matt is medication-assisted treatment. So she comes back. Um, she's now here. Readmitted, came through the ER, complete septic shock. She gets a central line in the ER, started on pressors, complex course again. So now she's got MSSA with her prosthetic valve endocarditis. And around this time, I actually get consulted to, because the ethics team was weighing in, on, involved on a case conference of, does she get a second shot? Do we give her a second valve? Um, and so this was just her uh, limited echo. So what do you do for these patients? This is now her second. Kind of interestingly, from the psychiatry perspective of competency, they felt that she has kind of a functioning, so she started, on, started drug use around the age of age 13. So kind of there's this theory that you become stunted at the age of which you start. So she has this functioning level, and I've just talked to her, and I can completely see this in having discussions with her, of she's, it's almost very, she's very childlike. It's almost like talking with a 13 year old to have an understanding of her illness, the repercussions and the risks and the consequences of her illness. So psychiatry was consulted, did not feel that she was competent. Um, she was finally committed for chemical dependency treatment. So she is in our hospital until we can get her to a chem death program. Ethics was consulted. They asked me to weigh in on medication assisted treatment. And then the question was surgery, pain med medicine had been involved. Um, she was receiving narcotics at this time. She has since been transitioned to methadone, but that's because they did opt to do the surgery. Um, we'll go into kind of pain management post um, surgery and options for treatment there. So medication assisted treatment. So ultimately in this patient, they opted to replace the valve. She's replaced the valve. She is committed. Um, she has been started on methadone. Um, so it, just to know the rules, methadone is federally regulated. I cannot start methadone for addiction on a patient in the hospital. Methadone can be used to prevent withdrawal and for pain. So she is on, I believe, 20 milligrams a day. I really wanted to just, I really tried to push Suboxone because I'm gonna talk about it. I think Suboxone is a better option for her, but she is very adamant. And then ultimately it's the patient's choice. I can't force a treatment on her. I can't say, oh, you're gonna, we're gonna wean you off and on methadone and put you on Suboxone because there are kind of equal studies in this regard. I just like the safety profile of Suboxone over methadone for a myriad of reasons. So the, at, at this point, she is maintained on 20 milligrams a day uh, methadone and the social work, the licensed alcohol drug counselor are working for placement in an inpatient facility. I think as of the last notes I looked at, potentially Unity is where she would be going. 
they can maintain the methadone at the level of 20, um, but then she would need to be set up with an opioid treatment program. Um, so methadone federally regulated, you have to go to an opioid treatment program for, um, to get your ongoing methadone dose. And it's, it's kind of like a, you do good, you can kind of stepwise approach. So you have to show up daily. You guys are probably all familiar with this. People that show up at the methadone clinic, get their dose um, daily. Once you graduate with stability and showing that you're basically a good person and not abusing it, you can get take homes on the weekends, things like that. Different than Suboxone, which can be um, prescribed by primary care providers. So methadone versus Suboxone. So milestones in treatment, this is just a little bit of the history. The Data Act allowed qualified primary care physicians to, um, or just qualified physicians, I should say, if you're a cardiologist, you could do this if you wanted to. You could prescribe Suboxone. I do it. Um, primary care was mainly who this was targeted at, OB-GYN uh, is another, to do office-based opioid treatment. And there's three medicines, obviously, we use primarily. So methadone, again, federally regulated. You're taking that one out of the mix. They have to go to specialized programs for that. Um, but now Trexone is another, not a favorite in the early area, in the early um, sobriety phase, more so something to discuss later when they're stable. But then basically this was buprenorphine. So buprenorphine is approved by the FDA in 2002. Then there's the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act. This is newer as of 2016, and this allows nurse practitioners and physician assistants to become eligible to prescribe buprenorphine for treatment of opioid use disorder. So um, this is an article, this one was from the Journal of Substance Abuse Treatment in 2017, and it's just showing that addiction consult services, what we are planning on doing here at Abbott and are in the process of doing, um, we work. <laughs> um, so this was, again, Boston Medical Center, and what they did is this was a kind of review of when they implemented their service in 2017, and so I believe it was the first 26 weeks of the program. So they saw an N of 337. This is what they were seeing. If this was their own 147 only opioids, then 117 polysubstance becomes an issue here. Um, these were the medications that they were recommending. Methadone, buprenorphine, naltrexone for opioid use disorder. Naltrexone can be used for alcohol use disorder. If you're seeing me ordering it in the hospital, um, we primarily so far have only been using it for alcohol. It's the only times I've ordered it here. Acamprosate is camprol, um, so alcohol decreases cravings. Topamax, eh, um, not comfortable with that one. And then disulfram is anabuse. The data isn't as strong on that for alcohol. Anabuse, I hate personally. No patient is going to really want to take anabuse. Everybody know what anabuse is. I know my pharmacists do. But anabuse is the one where if you take it, you have to take it daily. And if you drink, it makes you throw up. You get a disulfram-like reaction from it. Not pleasant. Nobody likes to keep taking it. So what they found, um, so the addiction team was kind of a comprehensive team. So they worked with the licensed alcohol and drug counselors. And what they found is retention. So they did linkage to care. And so this was first 30, 90, 180. Um, methadone here, buprenorphine here. So high retention. Obviously, it's going to drop off over time. You have difficulties in these large hospital systems to see, like, you can go to a different methadone program. It becomes harder to track these patients, especially when they get into outpatient intervention. So I think that that is one of the limitations of this study is that it does become more difficult to track these patients over time. It's not that they necessarily dropped out and weren't you know, in a program. Maybe they switched to a different primary care system that was prescribing it. Yes, they don't look great, but 49%, if I can link roughly 50% of my heroin users to some sort of treatment, they have greater rates of stability, decreased IV drug use, so you're decreasing your risk factors. This is a harm reduction model. Um, this was a Cochrane review. It's difficult to dig through. Um, so it was comparing kind of buprenorphine maintenance therapy versus placebo, so nothing. Kind of your abstinence-only programming, which is, seems to be the old way in my mind, or methadone. So it was a meta-analysis. They looked and they found that flexible dose buprenorphine, where we're titrating it based on their symptoms, and methadone, they had similar results for reducing illicit use. Methadone, slight, so statistically significant edge for retention and treatment. This is slight, but most studies found no difference. Um, but definitely buprenorphine over placebo. So the problem with methadone is if you live, I'm from Alaska, Kodiak Island, Alaska, bears, I guarantee you they don't have a methadone program there. I can tell you they have an opioid problem, though. 
um, my father wants me to come there and be an addiction doc, but um, you're not going to have access to a methadone program. So yes, you might have better retention and treatment, but there's this limited access. And this is where being an outpatient Suboxone provider comes in and is beneficial because the family practice doc in Kodiak can then can maintain these patients. So some retention is better than no retention. Um, and then illicit opioid use, definitely better than placebo, which is what they have essentially at places like Kodiak at this point. And this is the risk benefit of methadone versus bup. And this is why I like buprenorphine. So methadone is a full opioid agonist. You're going to get the respiratory depression. There's a dose-related increase in risk for respiratory depression. Methadone, um, you have to deal with QTC prolongation. So there's plenty of drug-drug interactions, especially in your HIV patients. I'm not even going to go into the list of drug-drug interactions. I couldn't find a nice cute table. It would have taken up too much space. But just know that drug-drug interactions occur. So buprenorphine is a partial agonist. We'll get into that doesn't have the QTC effect, and there's very few drug-drug interactions that we need to worry about. Um, we do worry about liver somewhat with buprenorphine, so comes into that if they're in liver failure when we would be comfortable prescribing it. So buprenorphine, this is a, from the CDC website, I believe, this graph, just knowing you're partial agonist, you're full agonist. So full agonist is methadone. So opioid effect, dose-dependent. More methadone, decreased respiratory rate, respiratory rest, death. What we've been seeing. So, buprenorphine is a partial agonist. It is at the mu opioid receptor. So, it binds with a high affinity to that mu opioid receptor and it blocks other opioids from binding and it also kicks off other opioids. So, if you went out and shot up with heroin, you come into my ER, even if we gave you a little bit of Narcan, and I decide I'm going to induct you on bup. I'm going to put you into the most wicked withdrawal of your life and you're going to hate me and you're never going to want to use buprenorphine again which was one of the issues that I had with this patient we talked about. I go and sit down and talk to her, and granted, she didn't really want to chat. She's not the most chatty of people. Um, but she said, oh, I tried it once. Well, they gave it to her when she was inpatient at Fairview, I think, to ward off withdrawal. And I suspect, my theory, is that they gave it to her when she wasn't in an adequate enough state of withdrawal, and it made her feel horrible. So she's like, I don't want that. So she already has this stigma that she wants methadone because it's not going to make her feel horrible, like the buprenorphine, even no matter amount of coaching that I tried I was going to get through that. So you don't get the respiratory depression with it because you get this partial agonist. Um, and then it slowly dissociates from the receptor over about 72 hours. That's going to come into play when I discuss microdosing. Also, it's a weak antagonist at the kappa. And this just goes your average dose of buprenorphine and how many of your receptors are about the percentage of your receptors that are occupied. So the standard patient is on usually like 12 to 16 is a good maintenance dose. After 32, you don't get any more increased effect by increasing your dose of buprenorphine. There's really no indication for them to be on such higher doses because you've taken out all, pretty much almost all those receptors. It's a lot of diminishing returns there. So then this, um, totally stolen from stock photos on the internet. This hurts, obviously. So what do you do with these patients? You have a patient with infective endocarditis. You're doing open heart surgery on them. What do you do after surgery? How are you going to make them stable and send them out in the community? Because you're basically going to make them an addict because this hurts, so you got to treat their pain. So this is a new thing that's out, and we're seeing a lot in our literature. I don't think we've done it here because you haven't had an addiction service. I know my colleagues at Hennepin and Regions have done it on select patients. I think that this would be an excellent option for this subset of patients, this infective endocarditis patients. And our team, there's three of us, would love to entertain this as an option for the patient. So these are called micro dosing protocols. Um, there are myriads of ones out here. This one was in JAMA, was talking about a micro dosing protocol essentially on patients. It's mainly case reports now. Um, there isn't like an RCT on these patients. There needs to be more research. I think it would be an amazing area of research if anybody's interested. Um, so there's different rates, but the big ones are um, going to be the Bernese method that I'll talk about, and then there's kind of a modified Bernese method. So what is microdosing? Have you heard of microdosing when it comes to uh, hallucinogenics? That's not it. So there, there's this talk of hallucinogenic microdosing for psych. This is not it. So what it is is a gradual induction of buprenorphine that is overlapping with the patient being on a full agonist therapy. The goal is that the patient does not develop a precipitated withdrawal. So what they found in these case studies, and the, the physiology of it makes sense, is that repetitive administration of very small amounts, we're talking like 0.2 milligrams, 
And like I said, 16 milligrams daily could be the standard dose for some of these patients. With sufficient dosing intervals, there's dosing of like BID, TID, should not precipitate opioid withdrawal because you're still getting a full agonist. And so there is a long receptor binding time. So what the theory is, is I give you a little bit of buprenorphine. It takes up some of those receptors. It takes about 72 hours to go off the receptor. And then you get this gradual accumulation of buprenorphine at the receptor and that you can replace it with, by dropping down your full agonist. So this is the Bernese method. This was out of Switzerland, I believe. And what he did is it was two case reports case so it's case series i guess two case reports the first was on a street heroin case and interestingly in switzerland you can be prescribed diacetyl morphine which is heroin <laughs> so you can get prescription grade heroin in, in switzerland because that was the second case so what this uh, what they did here is they had the patient come in this was more of an outpatient protocol it took over 10 9 to 10 days and they did it several times on her without having significant issues so they dosed her at 0.2 milligrams sublingual, this is what she used. So she's dropping down her use is what you're seeing over time and he is gradually increasing her um, buprenorphine dose. And then this was kind of her daily, this was the second one with the diacetyl morphine. It was a little bit of different dosing protocol because it was a diacetyl morphine so it didn't make sense to present it here because we don't use medical grade heroin. Um, so essentially, you can see here, the dotted line is the full opioid agonist dose. This was a chronic pain patient was the second one. So they were on like a long, uh, short acting opioids and then the diacetyl morphine and had some methadone. Um, and then the buprenorphine dose is going up over time. This protocol, the Bernese method is long, which is what one of the um, kind of downsides to that is. The microdosing one, and this was in, just came out in 2018, the American Journal on Addiction um, talked about, and this was in a chronic pain patient, so they were on hydromorphone, all done inpatient, so this is not something I would, I would potentially be doing outpatient just in my bridge clinic in the ER, but for some of these IE patients might be an option. So they gave 0.25 sublingual, and their theory was is because the time to peak on the buprenorphine is around one hour, that you could potentially give this faster and they found success with it. And that it was two cases, and they were different titration protocols. Um, I think that is all I have. Sorry, I think we do have a couple times for questions. So this is just a quote I like, but if we view it as an illness, addiction will be treated. Questions? Yes. So thank you um, both for also for the collaboration with some of our patients. I think this concept of um, how to treat this has been really enlightening for us in the sense that, you know, you and Dr. Kearney have pointed out, if you've got someone with renal disease, you have a renal consult, you have expert uh, help with these patients. And so it's really, I think, a good thing to have your team's expert help now available. Um, we see a lot of addictions other than opioids. Yes. Um, and so I wonder if you have comments on, I would say meth in particular is mm -hmm. the one that I know we see a lot of. And, are there any pharmacologic medications? Yeah. Uh, Meth is hard. Coming down the pike or what? So methamphetamine is hard. Um, right now there is no FDA approved treatments for methamphetamine use disorder. Um, there are studies that I think are being done currently looking at naltrexone. So naltrexone is a full opioid antagonist. So naloxone, naltrexone, naltrexone is longer acting. We use naltrexone frequently for alcohol use disorder to decrease cravings. I suspect there'll be more studies coming out looking at that. Um, incidentally, like my colleagues at Hennepin will use it on select populations, but that's not anything published. It, it, it would have to be a discussion with the patient to consider it. The issues with naltrexone obviously is it's long acting, so you're blocking those opioid receptors for a decent amount of time. Um, Vivitrol, if you guys have heard of that, is the long-acting naltrexone. So for, it's great for alcohol use disorder. You go into your clinic, and we would be hopefully offering it at the Bridge Clinic, um, where you get the injection. It's a depot injection, lasts one month. Um, makes it easier for use. Otherwise, people are having to remember to take a pill daily. With that, the thought is, is it's decreasing your cravings. A camper state or camperol is another one that can decrease cravings. We have to take a TID. There's risk of itching. It's, there's more of a side effect profile. It's not well tolerated. Um, so harder to get people to want to comply with that. So we can also be consulted on alcohol use disorder. We could be consulted on a methamphetamine. It's just a little harder. There's not a whole lot that we have to offer at this point. 
spot we had for years a very active pain yes. group here. Mm -hmm. How is this going to interact with them? I mean, I think most of us thought that when we got a pain consult, we were sort of doing some of this already, and it's apparent that we're not. They have no interest in, <laughs> in doing this. So when I kind of brought this forward, I sat down with Matt Monsine, and they were more than happy to offload patients. And in some of the consults, it's been Monsine who's put in the addiction consult because they think that the patient would be better served with an addiction consult versus um, a pain medicine consult. Basically, addiction is more if you're concerned that they're displaying some of the aberrant behaviors. Um, we've had some overlap, and I think that's a gray area that we will, the two services, work out, but we're able to work well together. The only issue I have, and I I guess this would be my caveat is if you have a patient with an addiction concern, consult us early because if they go into surgery and they get started on methadone, unless we're considering a micro induction protocol on Suboxone, it's really hard for us to convince them to do Suboxone. And it needs to kind of be this planned approach to what we would do afterwards. Yeah. Uh, scales for futility. Not that I have found. Um, and I think this is where, like when I was looking at the ethics, if Kearney were here, he could probably talk about that more because this is his area of expertise. There really isn't good data that we can find on who should not get a second valve or who shouldn't get a third valve. I mean, there have been case reports of people getting multiple valves and then being successful afterwards. My view is the addiction provider. So in this patient's case, for example, I think when I wrote my initial consult note, I was like, I can't say that she has had the best chance after the first valve because we didn't address the underlying problem. I think you could have easily made a different case if an addiction team had been involved, she had been started on medication assisted treatment, we did a warm handoff to care, we had a plan in place, then you could make an a, 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 a argument that yes, we did the best we could with her primary disease. And that's where I come at it from it. I think your perspective as the cardiothoracic surgeon is going to be different potentially based on these cases too. Those patients who are most likely to respond. I think those patients most likely to respond, and this is more, are those that would be engaged in receptive to treatment. Um, I have a hard time committing people. So everybody says when you're an addict, you have to hit rock bottom. You have to know, you know, you're at your bottom and be there to do it. So the patients that are going to be most receptive are the ones that kind of have that come to Jesus moment, so to speak, and that aha moment where, you know, this is it. I, I, I could be dead if I don't get this valve. And it, it becomes complex with a lot of it. So there's something called the ACEs score, and this goes back to psychiatry. It's adverse childhood events scores. And it's very interesting in that it stratifies, like, were you living with an alcoholic as a kid? Were you exposed to drug abuse? You know, did you not have enough food in your home? Were you it's like all of this like abuse as a child and if your aces score i think if it's like five or higher don't quote me on that you have like some ungodly like 50 percent or more rate of being addicted to a drug um, and it gets higher as you go up from there so you have to take that into consideration with this too can you just briefly tell us uh, the services to yeah so as of september Third, you have addiction medicine and medical toxicology consults. So our backgrounds is we are medical toxicologists. We've done two-year fellowships in medical toxicology and then kind of had this grandfathering in with addiction medicine. The Med Tox Fellowship covers a lot of that. Um, so you can put an inpatient consult in for addiction medicine. It's not the comprehensive assessment. That goes to a licensed alcohol and drug counselor. That goes into our inbox and we can see patients with any substance of abuse concern. The medical toxicology would be for things like overdose, um, we do withdrawal states, benzodiazepine withdrawals. There's options for treatment with like a phenobarb taper. There's medications out there for kind of inpatient treatment on some of these more complex patients. Um, then what we have coming down the pipeline, I'm still working with Alina kind of on the IT setup, is there will be an emergency department phase. It's an ED-based project. I'm an ER doc primarily by training. You'll see most me in the ED most of the time. So it's an ED-based bridge clinic where someone from my team we're going to have clinic days using the emergency department as my clinic space because space is a premium on this campus, seeing patients from around 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And we'll be scheduling them for follow-up. So if I see your patient, I say you're a great candidate for Suboxone, we start something in the hospital, then they can follow up with me 
weekly. And these patients, when we start them on something, need to be seen weekly, ideally. They have to kind of graduate to show stability before, like my sister's been in recovery for a year now and she still goes every two weeks to get her refills and drug testing for compliance drug screens. Um, but that's the thought behind this bridge clinic and that it's a bridging to where they are stable because you have these family practice docs, internists that are not comfortable with these patients that you've just seen that are kind of in this very tenuous, not really stable, could relapse at any moment. They don't want to take that on in a clinic setting. They're not equipped to do that. And so we get them to the stable point and then we can pass them off to community providers or while they're waiting for inpatient treatment, like this woman had four to six weeks, would she have done better if she'd been started on a maintenance treatment, potentially had less use, less risk, possibly? I was just gonna point out on the cardiology standpoint, you know, there's a lot of interest when these patients come in with huge vegetations and your case actually represented a septic MRI and then a pulmonary artery rupture. Is, uh, there's actually a thing called an angiovac that you go in and vacuum off a tricuspid. That was, I saw, so I went through, I was digging through her chart, and at Fairview, that was from the cardio, cardiology notes, that was the possible recommendation when she was stable, and so I wasn't aware of that, but they said they could consider it, that was in their note, but she obviously left. And, uh, but it was associated with an ICD lead, and it was a guy with, uh, with uh, enterococcus, it wasn't, you know, he's mm -hmm. five or six centimeters, but it is something to at least think about at the time. Second part of it is, you know, we get in because of the what, what electrophysiologists do. We see these patients because they're in heart block after we get their valve surgery or whatever. And some of them we try to wait and wait, even though they're in heart block, until we, we think they're going to be relatively sterile. But because of the recidivism, it's almost like, and, and you know, when you put in that bioprosthetic or prosthetic valve and and or leads, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden you created even a greater incidence of infection because if you, know, if, you, if you go back to using it again, in all likelihood, you'll get infected a lot faster if you have a need or a mechanic or a mm -hmm. of us or a So it's a, it's, a, it's a very difficult field uh, as I see it. And, and so I, 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 I wish we really had a good understanding of addiction. So what is it about some people's brain versus others? There is a genetic component to addiction. I mean, we found that it's, yeah, there's the genetic component. And I think it goes with resilience factors. It gets into more of a psychiatric based thing. Like, do you have the risk factors and the resilience to deal with life stressors? There's no way that I can say like, look, I have a sister who's a heroin addict. I'm kind of the antithesis of that. I don't know why I ended up the way I did and she ended up the way she did. We both have the same genetic makeup. I'm probably genetically predisposed to it. I think that's where like Nora Volkow and there's a lot of the neuro, um, neuropathology research going on. They show that different parts of the brain light up differently, like your dopamine pathways in your brain if they do functional MRIs of these patients. I don't think we have a good answer for it. I do think that we need to move away from this like blaming environment where you should be strong and be able to handle it because there is biochemical changes in the brain. Why does someone have a different dopaminergic response to cocaine than, than another? So that's one of the dangers that if you don't have an addictive personality, you'll tend to be more judgmental. Possibly, why, yeah. You know, why don't, you know, why do you, why do you keep doing this to yourself? You're trying to kill yourself. Because they can't see it. Like, but they don't like, see it, mm -hmm. but you see it, but in, in a way it's being judgmental because of course, you don't have that craving. Mm -hmm. You're not, you know, you're not susceptible to that. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, if we understood that, we probably institute or have better treatments. True, so and bias would be. I agree. And prevention, getting more of this out in the community. I mean, the rate limiting issue here is there's not people wanting to do addiction. There's not enough providers out there to do it, and especially in small communities, in, even in our metro area it's at a premium to be able to get patients in for treatment to, to programs. So um, there are four of us technically, one's out on leave, but Sean Boley, we're all emergency medicine. So we all work as EM docs as well. Um, Sean Boley is at United. So we're part of emergency care consultants. So we're a multi-private group of ER physicians that staff Healthy System, United, 
and Abbott and then some of the outlying smaller hospitals. So Sean is primarily based at United and then my colleague Dan Sessions is in the Healtheast system. And so when you see us rounding, I kind of am the one based here because we're at each, we have these different sites, um, but you'll see Sean and Dan as well. It varies on where you're located. Um, I'd say at least a month to two months for an inpatient program and then outpatient programs, probably around the same, depending on if they're established. I just have one last comment or point. The one you made about um, going back to the same environment. You know, it's very clear, at least from my experience, patients, even if you have an alcoholic that mm -hmm. goes back to the small town where all of the social areas socialization occurs at the local bar. Mm -hmm. The odds that they're not going to return to drinking is slim to none. Mm -hmm. Slim to none. And I think again I'm not you know, I'm, I'm not a, a drug expert, but we get to see lots and lots of patients through the years. They the same thing unless there's a family or there's somebody committed to actually have them go elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The uh, the recidivism rate is just is just astronomical. Mm -hmm. And as a healthcare provider, it's very frustrating. And we had a patient very similar to this one that um, we didn't put a pacemaker in for three months. And she was in a complete heart block going about 40. And ultimately, we did. She was staying with her foster family actually here in the Twin Cities. She went back to South Dakota with her buds. And in short order, after we put the pacemaker in, she was reinfected and she was a mess. And I, I, I know she died because mm -hmm. the, the, the doctors there said enough's enough and they didn't want to do another one and that was it. Yeah, and that, that, that's where, so medication assisted treatment isn't the be all end all. It has to go along with these coordinated programs. <coughs> Excuse me. That's <coughs> It will happen again. I mean, it's yeah. just like it's a self <laughs> prophecy. If you keep doing it, it will keep happening. These severe patients that we're talking about here, excuse me, <clears throat> definitely need like an inpatient program on top of medication assisted treatment. Excuse me, I totally have a frog in my throat. So these aren't the patients where I start them on Suboxone <clears throat> and they go out into the community and they're great. These are the patients that would be seen in Bridge Clinic. The ED social worker has um, dedicated time to help us with this care coordination so that we can at least maintain them to do harm reduction strategies with them until they can get into their treatment program with the inpatient treatment. This case being an example, yes, needs the full meal deal inpatient treatment. Um, wouldn't even consider weaning these patients off of any medication assisted treatment for over a year. They need to show a year of stability before we would even broach that discussion. There is a patient committed upstairs, not a cardiovascular issue, <clears throat> but one of, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> one of the issues is there's abstinence only treatment programs. And we had started him on um, Suboxone and they can't place him anywhere. Sorry, I totally have a frog in my throat. And uh, one of the things they wanted us to do was do a taper get him off the Suboxone. And basically I was like, that's not the standard of care with this medication. You need to look for a program. I feel these abstinence only programs are very antiquated and they are not with like the trend of where we are at with appropriate treatment for these patients. So my note was basically, that's not the standard of care. He should be on it for a year before we even discuss it. Um, potentially these patients, if they are a high functioning member of the community, I don't care if you're on buprenorphine for years. Um, studies have shown that there is an increased risk of relapse when you taper down and try and go off. Um, if they're able to maintain and be functioning members of society, who am I? I'm not the judge. I'm not the one to say, no, you can't have it. You need to not be on an, an uh, opioid treatment therapy. So, thank you. Thank you.